Welcome back, everyone. So we've been talking about compressed sensing and how you can get away with many, many fewer measurements than you would normally think you could, you could get away with if those measurements have an aspect of randomness to them. And so I'm gonna illustrate this on a really fun example, which is kind of a toy example of an audio signal in Python, okay? So what we're going to do is we're gonna create a signal that is essentially a signal in time, so some audio signal in time, that is very, very sparse in Fourier. In fact, it's going to be a two-tone audio signal that is going to be uh, created by taking the sum of a 97 hertz cosine wave and a 777 hertz cosine wave. So this, this signal is ultra simple. Um, in the time domain, it's just gonna look like a sum of two cosine waves. And in the Fourier domain, it's going to basically just have two uh, power peaks at 97 and 777 hertz. Okay, very, very sparse. This is a toy problem that illustrates what an audio signal reconstruction problem would look like. Okay, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a very high resolution uh, version of that signal at a sampling rate of 4096 hertz or 4096 samples per per second okay and then what we're going to do is we're going to massively massively downsample that uh, that signal to get y but we're going to do it randomly okay so this is super important and i'm going to walk through this a little bit but the basic idea here is that the the shannon nyquist sampling theorem would say that if i want to recover this uh, very high frequency component, the 777 hertz component of my signal, there's no way I could do that if I sample my system at a rate of like 128 hertz or something really low, low frequency. Okay, so low frequency sampling, if I sample at low frequency, and I'm just gonna draw a picture here, it's just really simple to understand. If I have something uh, really, really high frequency like this, but I sample this thing really, infrequently, then there's no way you can tell that this high frequency stuff is happening. You're going to think that this signal is only that one low frequency uh, sine wave, okay? And so that, that's kind of the heart of this uh, Shannon Nyquist uh, sampling theorem. I'm gonna do a whole video on Shannon Nyquist and information theory and kind of traditional uh, signal processing before compressed sensing, kind of before this uh, turn that on its head, but the basic idea is that if this signal has really, really high frequency components and I sample uh, too slowly, there's no hope of picking this up, okay? Uh, and I wanna say it's, uh, you have to sample at like half of the frequency so that you can pick kind of these peak to peak variations, okay? Um, but I'll, I'll do a whole, a whole video on that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sample at an average sampling rate of 128 hertz which we know from Shannon Nyquist should not work at all. We should completely fail to reconstruct the low and high frequency components of this. But the catch with compressed sensing, the reason you can beat Nyquist here is because this Y, or rather this theta, is random, okay? So these Y points are not uniformly sampled in time, they are randomly sampled in time, and that makes a big difference. So if I randomly sample this in time, it's absolutely true that on average, my sampling rate's gonna be way too low. So on average, I'm gonna get these points that are really far apart. But on average, I'm also gonna get points that are really close to each other sometimes. So I will get, a I will get some points that are right next to each other if I randomly sample. And so I'll get all kinds of points, some of them close, some of them far, some of them in between. Uh, and the second piece of information about this random sampling is I assume that even though my average sampling rate's very low, 128 hertz, I'm assuming that I have my sampling on a very, very fine clock so I know exactly when that sampling occurred. So I know exactly when this sample occurred in time uh, at that very, very high resolution clock. I, so I know my, the resolution of when my sample occurred uh, to a resolution of 4096 per unit time, okay? That's really important. So you need to have your random measurements so that sometimes you get points closer or farther away from each other, so you're exploring kind of all of the frequency space possible, and you also need to have these measurements on a really precise clock, so even if on average, its low uh, low sampling rate, I know very precisely when each of those samples occurred, 
That's the set setup we have here. Okay, so we're assuming that we have an average sampling rate of 128, but uh, we know very precisely when they're sampled. Okay, good. And so what we're going to do is uh, to get this random sample, we're going to run this, uh, this kind of line here to get these, these random permutation vectors. So we're going to just randomly pull indices from this 4096 high fidelity signal. That's going to give me these kind of yellow points here. Uh, good. And now I'm just going to plot them. And I'm not running this in real time because this is a little bit slow, uh, but you can run this at home. You can download all this code from databookuw.com. Uh, we have the code in Python and MATLAB, okay? And there's a link in the, uh, in the comments. Okay, good. So here I'm just plotting some stuff, uh, and what you see here on the left, this is the actual time series. I've zoomed in a little bit, and it looks a lot like what I have here. I have this kind of two-frequency you know, I've got low frequency stuff, and then I've got this ultra high frequency stuff. And these red X's are my random sampling points at an average of 128 hertz. So I have 128 measurements per second, but they can be anywhere randomly in that signal. So you'll notice here I've got a bunch of points kind of bunched up. That means I'm, I'm getting some points really close together, other points very far apart. I measure very little in this region here, okay? This kind of makes sense. If your signal's sparse and doesn't have that much information, I really only need to sample a few regions very, very fast to get the high frequency stuff. And then the other stuff uh, I'll get with the low frequency, kind of these, these spread out points. So I don't need to measure you know, every region at full 4096 sampling rate because I'm gonna get that information from these points here, kind of. At least that that's gives you a, a gut feeling for, for how this might work. And then, um, Here's the power spectrum. You see that there are two peaks because it's the two-tone uh, wave. And now we can actually solve uh, for this problem using, uh, we can solve this compressed sensing problem. We can solve for the S that has the minimum one norm, meaning it'll be the sparsest S that satisfies, that's consistent with those 128 measurements, okay? Um, and we're gonna do it here using this COSAMP code, which is compressive sampling with matching pursuit. Uh, this is a really, really cool algorithm. If you want to read more about this, this is a greedy algorithm matching pursuit, and it's a really fast and accurate way of solving these problems. It works especially well if S is really, really sparse. So for very sparse problems, this is faster than some of the other techniques um, I might show you, like CVX. Um, and I, I'll probably have a whole video on greedy methods uh, later, okay? But if you want to read about this, you can read about it in our book. You can read about this uh, in papers by Joel Tropp and others, really cool stuff, okay? So this uh, has run, it's finding the sparse solution S, and then I can inverse Fourier transform that to see what the original signal was that's consistent with those measurements. And when you do that, you find the red points down here is the inferred sparse vector S. This is the power spectrum of the inferred sparse vector. And then when you inverse, uh, it's actually not just a Fourier transform, it's an inverse cosine transform because I'm using a discrete cosine transform, you get a signal that very faithfully reproduces the high resolution uh, white signal up here. Okay, so this is not magic, but it is super cool. From these red, un uh, non-uniformly, randomly spaced points that have an average sampling rate that should be far too low for this high frequency data, with compressed sensing, you're able to figure out what those high frequency components are and inverse Fourier transform uh, to find to find your solution. So I think this is really, really interesting. Um, for me, the proof is in the pudding. You can talk all day long about the math of high dimensional vectors and geometry and, and whatnot, but until you actually try it out on an example like this and see it working, it's hard to really place that math uh, in an applied setting. So for me, I think this is really important to understand what's happening in compressed sensing, okay? Now, there are a few things I want to point out to you. Um, yeah, so, First of all, all of this code is on our book website, databookuw.com. Uh, and again, if you like this material, if you think this is useful, please uh, hit like and subscribe and hit the bell, write a comment. Um, I almost always make small typos or don't explain things, so I can you know, help you uh, kind of flesh that out in the comments. So some things I wanna point out here, and this is almost homework for you uh, at home, this 
example of beating the Nyquist sampling frequency I think is really compelling because Y has an average sampling rate of 128 hertz. Now, what I would like you to do is run through this exact same example, but instead of picking these red points at random, like I did here, I want you to pick them uniformly downsampled to 128 hertz, okay? So my, my original signal is 4096. I want you to downsample that to 128 hertz, and that means you basically measure only every every 32 entries, you only measure every 32 entries, okay? So you measure the first one, the 33rd, and so on and so forth. That will downsample this to 128 hertz uh, signal. And then I want you to run through the exact same code. In fact, I want you to try to run any optimization you possibly can to find an S that is consistent with those 128 measurements. And my strong suspicion is, because I've done this a lot, for, for this particular problem, is that if, if you use uniform downsampling, you will absolutely get the wrong sparsity pattern and the wrong signal. With uniform downsampling, you won't be able to get this high frequency phenomenon because of the Shannon Nyquist uh, theorem. Okay, And so I think that'll be really, really helpful for you at home to convince yourself that what's happening here really does depend on the randomness of the sampling and knowing precisely when those samples occurred in time, because when you do kind of a naive uniform downsampling, all of this will break down. And that's relatively simple for you to code up uh, and try out. Okay, so I really hope you've enjoyed this. I hope this makes this a little bit more concrete. Um, again, if you have any questions, if there's anything you want to know about, just you know, ask me, uh, and I'll try to get to it with, with you know, a follow-up comment or videos uh, when I have time. So really excited to show you kind of the next round of what you can do with sparsity. All right, thank you.